Hello, all you karmic capitalists. Welcome back to, what is it, episode 14, Denise? Are we on episode 14? I haven't been counting, but it seems like 114. <laughs> it is 14. <laughs> so thanks for everyone who has joined us in the past. Welcome back. And for those joining us for the first time, welcome. This is Consciousness Incorporated, where we talk about business and consciousness incorporating. So we have fun here. Uh, we go with the flow, uh, and each topic each week changes depending on how, you know how we feel and what topics mm -hmm. are relevant to all of you. So, but my name is Adam Vasquez, and I'm joined with my glorious co-host Denise Conkey. <laughs> and he always says glorious, and I kind of was like, oh, I thank you. Because Did you are. That because my light is all screwed up, and I can't fix it, and it makes me. <laughs> Bright and washed out. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, thanks for everyone for forgiving us with our technology, and and we're always trying to improve it, and we're tweaking it, and and and, and we get to learn in this process as well, right? Correct. So, Adam, what is our topic today? <laughs> so, last week we talked about trends, right? 2023. What are some trends this year at a macro level? We'll talked a lot about AI. Yes, um, we did. Last week, and it was a, such a super exciting topic, and I think very relevant for today in the yeah, future. Yeah, I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback that that was a good one. Okay, excellent, excellent. And so, and don't forget, I mean, to comment down if you're watching us live through YouTube or if you're watching us post live through one of the podcast channels, please reach out to us, send us an email, um, shoot us a note. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you. So your original question is, what are we talking about this week? Well, we're going to continue the trends conversation. Um, it, you know, we're looking at it as potentially being a three-part, but we'll see where we get to after right. this week. And, and today it's macro, isn't it? Yeah, we're going to talk about macro. We're, gonna, we're really going to talk about the decentralization of everything and what is driving that. And it sounds scary, but what we'll talk about is... It's just another day in paradise, and it is all cyclical. So uh, That's don't, right. be, don't be afraid. You remember, we're all consciousness ourselves, and we're infinite. And even if the news headline is everybody's going to nuke each other, uh, I can tell you through all the past life regression analysis and future life regression, we are still here on this planet having fun. So mm -hmm. we just, just like just we wake up. In the morning, just just another day, right? Just so another day, yeah. Macro trends are are things that uh, trends that a lot of people really ignore. I mean, people when we're talking mm -hmm. about business people, people in our business, marketers, they ignore them because they're so big and they sound so scary and they sound so far off that no one wants to deal with them. But coming down the pike, the macro trends, first of all, they come faster now than they ever did before. It's like the trend, the macro trend is digital versus analog. Okay, that took a little time to get here. But now these trends are just going to slap you upside the face. And your life will be changing like your day to day if you're working and into this and maybe if you're not because of these trends. Well, well, so all of us, right? I mean, this is we're going through a convergence right now, right? Everything's coming together and then it'll start expanding in many ways. But there's just so much a feeling like new things happening after another. But you know, like all technology, everything compounds over time, right? Yeah. In this in yeah. this physical experience. And the law of compounding, you just, it, most people underestimate. And that's mm -hmm. where we are. We're at, you know, it's 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 the old penny uh, joke. Would you rather get yeah. a, you know, how would you like to get paid? Would I you like a million bucks help. now? Or would you like a, a penny every second or, or what have you? A and penny then, that doubles. Yeah, a penny that doubles every day or what have you. You know, in, in that doubling, that compounding is billions of dollars. Billions whereas and billions and billions. Right. And, you know, as a advertising person, there was, I don't know if you remember this, there was a spot and I think it was a hair product. And the whole thing was and so on and so on 
and so on and so on. And they had little, you know, everything started to grow. And it was this realization that, oh my God, and so on. Because that's what happens with innovation. That's what happens with ideation. And that's how people do see the future is when they is when they look at a macro trend and go, what does that mean for me? And when will that have relevance? So yeah. part of it yeah. is time. Yeah, well, it, and, and with it all compounding, it, you know, with compounding and why it feels like it's going so fast, like you said, it, it compounding goes slow at first, and then it happens that fast because, right, it's the idea of um, uh, the thimble of water, not just the penny, but the thimble of water in a stadium. And there's, uh, there's I don't know if you heard that story, and I'm going to butcher it. So, you, so listeners, right. as you'll understand, just get the point of it. Uh, you know, fact, you can fact check me and correct me. I don't mind it, but I just want to get the point across on just how powerful compounding is. Again, so the idea is, if you were to chain yourself up to the top of a large stadium, right? Pick any of the big stadiums. You're up in the top rafter, the top seat, and say you handcuff yourself to the seat. And you doubled by a thimble of water or a shot glass of water or what have you, you double it every minute, right? So how, the idea is how long do you think you would have until the stadium filled and you would drown? How long do you have to get out? And when would you know that you need to get out and how much time? Well, it's something like, you know, first, I think it's less than 15 minutes the thing would fill up. And by the time it got up to um, up to the filling the bottom of the stadium, you know, the, the field area, yeah, you would have like 30 seconds to get out. Wow. So, so, I mean, just to show you, that's that sort of sense. I'm just trying to get everyone to get a clear picture of how that's that 30 seconds is the timeline we're on now. Okay. Right. You're not going to die. You're not going to drown. You may right. feel like you're drowning, but. All that, of technology is on that. All of right. technology doubles, knowledge doubles, mm -hmm. and the amount of opportunities and things that you could do, that doubles too. So it makes it really hard to not get paralyzed in this world because all of it doubles. You, there's too many choices and there's too many great products and there's, there's too much. It's a too much time. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, we have much. 30 seconds. If if it took 10 minutes to fill the bottom, it took 30 seconds after that to fill the rest of the stadium. So that's just gives you a perspective on, on all of this. And and uh, you know, when we talk about decentralizing it, and what does that apply to decentralizing everything else? Just the fact that the trend is speeding up and we will and so let's talk about decentralizing and the when we talked about this is cyclical. Yes. Denise, what do I mean by that? Like cyclical nature of this? Because I think people were thinking it's never going to return back to, but it goes, comes and goes, right? Yes. It, business happens in waves. And if you look at what's hot and what's not, and we talked about that last week, it's like that which is hot will no longer be hot. And then something else will be hot and then it will no longer be hot. So, and the, and those waves matter because they are a predictive model. Like fashion in some ways, right? Oh, sure. Like, yeah. hey, just wait long enough. It's going to be cool again. Bell bottoms will come back, right? Yes. And mullets are back, by the way. I don't I don't endorse mullets, but mullets are cool for high school kids right now. In case nobody, and nobody knew that. So if you had a mullet in the 80s, it's your time. Enjoy it. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> but even a mullet a has, has a second life. Said on this show. It, so, yeah. so, just on a side note, do you remember the mulletude, uh, mulletsgalore.com that was out around the, the, the 90s? It was one of the oh, yeah. early websites. Yeah. When it, when it ranked, it took pictures of people that had glorious mullets. Um, 
and then rank them and categorize them like a Camaro mullet or or what have you. And and I don't know if it's still up. So so if you're listening to it, someone look up mulletsgalore.com and you'll get a good laugh. But now it's his heyday again. So get some ideas, some some fashion ideas. I will not have a mullet. I never had a mullet, nor did I have a rat tail. And I and I I just it's not me. So do it. <laughs> I don't think anybody thought it was never you. Adam, <laughs> in case you were wondered if I ever had a mullet, you know, <laughs> nope. Adam, do you have a tattoo? I do not have a tattoo. Oh, well, and you know I why? Know. So the reason why I don't have a tattoo is not because I don't like tattoos. I love, you know, you know, I love art, and and it's some of the most, the great, some of the most talented artists are tattoo artists in the world and in history. Um, and the human skin is its, its unique canvas, obviously, right? So it's a living canvas, and, and you got to consider a lot of things, sun fade, colors, and skin color, tone, what looks good on you, your body shape. So it's, it's really uh, living art. Mm-hmm. So I so really appreciate it. But I just never had a g- good reason. I, I used to think in lacrosse, if we won, our college won a s- national championship, I would do something – to commemorate that that goal, that national right. championship. We did not win a national championship. We were ranked in the top 10, but we did not nationally, but we did not win a national championship. So my ambition of getting a tattoo kind of faded with that. Plus, I don't, I don't really like, you know, playing aggressive sports and playing at a high level of lacrosse is very physical, as you know, and I recently sprained a toe, like a turf toe and, <laughs> and all of that, which I can get into later. But <laughs> I, my point is, I, I I have a good. I don't think as much as women do. I don't think any man can take pain like women can, because just from no. childbirth alone. But for a man, a male standard, I think I can take pain really well. But I'm kind of a scared of needles, so I'm not sure I would go through the whole. Uh, I'm not scared. I'll take a needle, but I don't know if I could sit in a chair getting wow. pin pricked over and over and over and over and over again. It's really not that bad. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. And I, I've heard it's, it's, you get endorphins from it and, and there's a lot of stuff. So yeah, I just, I just don't have any tattoos. What about you, Denise? Oh yeah. I, I, oh, you have I, one right there. And I, I, I knew you had a couple. I had a couple and um, they're very meaningful for me and I'm glad I have them. And they're so meaningful. It's like, what would I put on next? Like nothing compares to these two for me in meaning. Mm-hmm. But if we go back to trends, here's a prediction. You talked about mullets. I think the tramp stamp is going to come back. Oh, man. Oh, no. Now, yeah, these are not yeah, macro trends, be. everyone. We have. We are going to talk about decentralization. But, the I, you know, I'm just predicting. So, so Denise, we heard it first. Is, Denise predicts his tramp stamps will be coming back soon. And, I, you know, I can see it. that. I can see that, yeah. you know. And one thing about the the waves, as a wave crests, the opposite is also true. So you could go to the opposite of the crest of the wave and say, all right, this is coming back because it will. It just will. It always does. So it's a way to predict the future, especially in business. So let's talk about that with decentralization. Obviously, from central to decentralization comes and goes. We see it in businesses. And anybody who's been in a company long enough, in a large company long enough, will see centralization to corporate. All the power goes to corporate. And then it decentralizes back to the business unit. And then it comes a little bit of a hybrid model and then it comes back and it goes out and comes back and comes out like almost, you know, and just again oh. and again. And it's, and then new leadership comes in and says, Hey, we're going to do this. And, and, you know, you see, you see the same cyclical nature in businesses yeah. and lifespans too, right? Because it's really a lot of it's tied in life stand spans. And we talked about, we've talked about the fourth turning from Neil Howell in the, in past podcasts. And I think it's worth, you know, it's, it's not the book, the book that answers all questions, of course, but it's a good reference to just this in our human or American experience. And the fact that, you know, if you look at a seculum of 80 years lifespan, roughly, we go through from a government perspective in a very, in a large institutions to decentralize to large. So in, yeah. 
And you start to think about that with what's politically going on in the United States now and, and party wise, even, mm -hmm. you know, Republicans are try are tending to be more decentralized. Ironically, Republicans in the Civil War were more centralized, right? Because, right, in the Democrats yeah, there is, yeah, were there anti centralization. Is. They wanted states in slavery and all that other stuff. So, so and Democrats there, out there, you guys were very pro slavery, just putting it out there back in the day. No, I, just, I, I, I know. Just like That's reporters, why. I just mean, but it just, but that shows you how things change, right? Change. And just it's cyclical, totally right? So, this, yeah. And you know with regard I mean? to Democrats and Republicans, people throw all that around like, oh, I know what a Republican believes and what a Republican does. Like, yeah. from what decade? Because the decades have changed. Republicans change. Democrats change. They change by the decade. It, 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 so it's like Lincoln, right? Talking about. <laughs> Republicans, I, I'm, I'm really independent. You know, I might be a registered Republican. I think I was a registered Democrat at one point. I, I mean, honestly, I'm I'm independent. I just want the best person to win. And there's usually not a good option. So you try to pick the lesser of two evils, unfortunately. But um, but if you look at it, like the Republicans hold on to the holy grail of Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. He was amazing. He was a Republican. But if you were to put Abraham Lincoln today, I bet you he would be a Democrat. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely positively. I'll tell you who else is someone that people assign, as presidents go, uh, assign curious tags on. All right, I'm going to say it. Richard Nixon. Oh, he is okay. a curious, he a curious, curious I, creature. I get it. See, everybody laughs. Everybody goes, he's a crook. He's a criminal. No, no, no. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying he is a curious creature. He's a curious creature because if you look at what he signed, he opened up the door to China. He signed revolutionary, very democratic looking by today's standards, laws and passages of, of things that really help people. And Technically, he did shut down the Vietnam War, which was an embarrassment, if you know history, to the United States and like a horrible, horrible thing. He did shut it down. He, did. he was he did. the he one did. who did that. And I remember that was his ad. It was Nixon's the one. And they had, okay, everything's an ad for me. It's in my DNA. Um, but they had a little picture of a soldier in Vietnam, it well, it started as a big picture and it went down, 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 down to a little square on the screen, and then it says Nixon's the one. And I'm like, well, okay, maybe he is the one. And well, also Nixon, I would argue, is the architect of the economic model we have today, in in the yeah. fact that we no took wrong. our he took us off of the gold standard, right? No wrong. And why did he take us off the gold standard? So you can love him or hate him for it, but I think the reality was, it we didn't have enough gold to back up our debt for Vietnam War or any of the other warmongering yeah. or other set asides and things that we needed. Uh, or maybe didn't need uh, luxury in this country. And and by doing so, he made the dollar basically the currency reserve standard. It, it already, always was after post-World War II. It became the currency reserve of the world, but it was still backed by gold. Once he yeah. removed gold, because he had to, or the government couldn't pay, he hadn't, didn't, we didn't have enough gold we to pay our debt, so he had no choice, right? Yeah. And and uh, and people like to blame the gold bugs will blame Nixon for being a terrible president for doing that. But, you know, it's all of our pro <laughs> it's everybody's fault, Republican or Democrats, for 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 us letting our debt get to a point to that level. And now Is yelling Fort Knox really a place anymore. What was that? Fort Knox. Huh? Yes, it is. It exists it and it has. There? We used to hold, and and for you gold bugs out there, again, fact check me, I don't mind. We used to hold something like 80% of the world's gold or 90% of the world's gold after World War II. And we we held it, we held uh, France's and everybody's, uh, sort of, we're just going to hold it for you. And then everybody and we gave them IOUs 
And then they're like, wait a second, I want my gold. Where's my gold? And they started knocking because they're like, where's it time to pay up the gold that you the back on the debt? And that's when Nixon was like, no, 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 no more gold standard. You get yeah, so got us out of that, you know, you know, tricky dick right. got us out of that one. So good. He tricked everybody out of that one. What of the okay. but that but that but now, but so that's one of the decentralization topics that yes. I think we should definitely talk about monetarily. Um but I think broader, you know, we talked about, you know, so money will definitely be something we talk about decentralization, but I think deglobalization is part of one of the bigger trend and, and it's connected to a, a lot of other things out there. Right. Can you and, talk about what deglobal? Yeah. So, is? so after world war two, there was a new world order and, and there's tons of people out there, um, talking about the new world order, what it could look like. Uh, you know, I think a lot of them are wrong or partially right. I think everybody's right and wrong, you know, like most things. But, um, you know, first off, China is not going to be a global superpower and we can talk about why. But um, yeah, I know. Even though, even that though that is, order. that's everybody says, oh, China's the next superpower. It's like, I don't, yeah, you're right. I don't think so. So there's a lot of great analysts out there, one of them being uh, Peter Zion and, and geopolitical analysts are very gloom and doom. So, you know, and they don't they usually don't, including Peter, he, they they miss the innovations or the things like we talk about consciousness entering the yes. equation yes. to change what we all see coming because somebody yes. saves it or it saves the day yes. or the universe wants to keep us going as a planet. So it yes. will it will come in and something will happen in perfect timing. Right. right. So so. I don't have the crystal balls on those things because those are the sort of what, if there's a black swan event, those are white swan events, right? So. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I don't um, know if it's ever been I'm writing, that, but we'll what? call it that. The white swan? Did you yeah. steal that or make that up? I just threw it out there. I, I, I'm i sure somebody's coined it before, but okay, if you I, have, yeah. I'm sorry I, I used it, but I didn't know. So that yeah, just went out of the ether. I'm writing blogs about the gray swan, which yep. is that which you don't know that's going to hit you in the face and then you're going to look back and say, Oh, I wish, you know, that was obvious, but yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so, so nobody predicts the white <laughs> swans, just like nobody predicts the black swans. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so when we think about what's happening and deglobalization is the fact that for world war two, there was only one military power left the United States, right. The, the currency was based on the U S the dollar, you know, it's good to be the king, right? You win. We policed all of the the trade routes and we became the world police, you know, and, you know, Team America, for those that like that reference, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there came a rise of some counterparties like the Soviet Union. And then that collapsed because many, for most reasons, we just outspent them and they couldn't keep up from their economy. And their economy Norman. is actually really puny. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's less than most of our states. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's puny. It's super small. Yeah. But they, their advantage is their natural resources they export. Obviously, their gas, their phosphates for all of that. So when we talk about the United States has been going to uh, more of a deglobalization. We don't care about global politics anymore as a country, like generally. Um we didn't care about global politics prior to World War II either. Sure, well, you're right. In in the U.S. Okay. is we go, we become nationalist, nationalized, and we come inward most times. And then somebody drops a bomb on us, or hits a World Trade Center, or or or, and then we get pulled into some conflict. I believe that that cycle is going to be changing. And I, I'm optimistic that this is the last time anything like that will happen. But, but what's happening is uh, they're real. The rest of the world is realizing the U S isn't the world police anymore. And they're not going to be out there protecting things. We have basically pulled out of the middle East pretty much all the way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We and follow. noted it's not in the headlines anymore. Yeah, it was always in the headlines, and now nobody talks about the Middle East. Well, now all. now that right. gives right, and that gives the opportunity for Israel, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and Iran to duke it out. To and duke I, it out, 
and cut up our, you know, our journalists in little pieces without repercussion, just yeah. going to say. Saudi yeah, def yeah, definitely. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, KSA, for that one. Um, and so so the question is, like, what's going to happen there? But we're not going to be doing that. And, and the Biden administration has made it perfectly clear if we do anything, it will be from afar, dropping in cruise missiles, whatever. But we send the gear. I think Ukraine is a good example. We will use other countries as proxies. We will not be direct conflict, which I don't think we should. But that's for another debate. Uh, so, yeah. so we, we see. I will, I will ask about that because I'm very curious about what you think. So we can, if we have time, we can jump into that. But uh, so setting it up, meaning there's just, just the economies are being decentralized. We don't know, you know, you look at the EU as being a centralized institution, but even that is shaky, right? Yep. Right. So, and, you know, and people are coming together in these macro, these sort of micro groups and you can see countries already attaching themselves to the U S like Japan, like, Oh, I'm with these guys because they know Without the help of the U.S., they're kind of, I mean, literally, figuratively, and realistically, they're on an island, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and and so you'll see countries start to kind of connect them to from a symbiotic relationship to, to get that. But the U.S. is no longer going to patrol the worlds. We don't have the Navy designed, or military is not designed for that anymore. Yeah. These are all good things and but it gives rise to other countries to influence different parts of the regions of the world and much more of what it was like pre-world war ii when the u.s was a power but not the power right correct and and when you look at the, the very idea of supply and demand well that's what's happening now the metaphor for supply and demand is happening as you can, you can parse countries that way. What is the supply and demand of a region like the Middle East? You know, uh, may the best, strongest evolutionary country win? Is that what we want? Do we want a fight? Do we want a win, a no win? Uh, do we want micro powers? All of that is some of what we have to think about when we think about the decentralization of the world, mm -hmm. because there will be symbiotic relationships and there will be winners and losers because we all don't know how to get along. And, and yeah, and many, there's too many people still believe in zero sum and we'll, we're getting past it. And those people yeah. are dying and they won't be able to reincarnate back because of the Ascension process, but we're still with them today. Right. So, yes. yes. And if you don't know what zero sum is, listeners, zero sum is like everything's a pie chart. And if you want something, you got to take it away from somebody else. Yep. And the, you know, marketing was very zero sum in the past in that there was a cap on possibility. So you looked at a sector and go and you went, how do I grow? I have to take it away from someone else. So marketing like uh, 25 years ago was can I do a competitive analysis and figure out who I'm going to take it from and how? That's less of a thing now. So old marketers would think like that. Who can I take share away from? And what do I have to do to do that? It's kind of a different world now because yeah. it's it's an open, it, there's there's more for everybody. There's enough for everybody. There, there are markets that are not even developed yet that we invent. You know, so that's my little tirade on zero sum. Well, yeah, it, 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 yes, yes. The universe is infinite, but us, us as karmic capitalists understand this. And if, if you're listening to this and you're interest, interested in what we're talking about and don't understand karmic capitalism, one of the pillars of karmic capitalism is it's an abundant infinite abundant. universe there is mm -hmm. scarcity is a belief system that doesn't need to exist because it really isn't truth right abundance Correct. is truth scarcity is actually false just like fear and lower vibration like we talk about the map of consciousness mm -hmm. so so that zero sum comes from fear and tribalism which is when we had to survive on this planet 
in and there wasn't enough resources where we thought yeah. there wasn't. And it's so. when you, boy, I don't even remember who I heard this from, but I was listening to something and they talked about the whole concept of survival of the fittest. And it is why we are an aggressive world. And it's because the people who uh, wanted to share, let's call it Native American Indians, and let's call it the the civilizations, the great civilizations of Africa and Mexico. And they basically were sharing and going, okay, they're here. Let's show them about what we do. And let's say they got smashed up. They got killed. So who won back then? And people would argue today is Darwinian. And, you know, who's stronger and who can beat somebody else's ass. So that's kind of the excuse for why we are such a well, violent and narcissistic world is because it's in our DNA because all the good guys got killed. Well, and Darwin was right and wrong, right? So Darwin was right in the fact that we evolve, but he was looking at it from an external environment yeah. perspective yeah. what he doesn't realize is the reason why we evolve physically outside it's because we evolve our souls inside so the evolution happens inside the external uh, you know the what we see is an after effect of that so like i always say to anybody if they want to change they have to change their thoughts and their beliefs oh Absolutely. You know, you want to change your physical existence and the certain situation you're in. There's something you need to change in yourself. In yourself yeah. In your thinking, you got to right? know about know thyself and be. And then it will manifest yeah, itself physically. It manifest. So, so when people grow wings or they learn how to eat something or develop a, I don't know, a, a an extra tooth so they can chew <laughs> like heavy things, it's because. They learned and they learned internally and then eventually their physical evolved. So it was instead of he, he was looking at it from an outside in and I'm saying evolution happens from an inside out. That's what that's what I'm saying. So. Okay. So when we think about going back to decentralization, so the economy is decentralized and the supply chain is getting more decentralized. Right. And, and really manufacturing in itself. So countries and companies, if you are. uh manufacturing localized uh, supply chains is where things are going to go with that meaning yeah. where where the customer is so right. and companies and countries are shifting that today and we're seeing that with all the silicon manufacturing coming back to the united states right yeah you can't buy a a, a piece of fabric that was made here that that's been the thing 10 you know 10 15 years all the fabric you know something as simple as you you mentioned silk mm -hmm. it's all made somewhere else not here well what happens then is when you have a supply chain crisis like covid um you can't get it anymore um right. and right because it required it relied on a globalization yeah. supply chain and everybody yeah. working together but once that breaks down it shows the major flaws on a large centralized yeah. system right and then pro technology in there like you know, all the semiconductors and all that. And it's like you have to have legislation in the United States to say, we're going to make our own. How crazy is that? Yeah. So so if you're a manufacturer and you're still manufacturing in China, you know, talking about deglobalization, they are a totalitarian communist state. They just want your IP. And, and I'm not anti-China, by the way. I love China. I have studied it. Uh, Peking University. I have lived there. I have I, I have a huge admiration for the culture and the people and what their potential is. But it doesn't change the fact that they're ruled by a totalitarian state that just wants control, right? Central control. In China, it the trend is your friend. You cannot fight the macro, right? You can't fight the macro, and and you're seeing. The, our own government and this administration in many ways try to keep a large centralized government, but it will fail because the trend is going the other way. They need to embrace it and figure out a way to still make it all work, but in a decentralized way. 
And I'm not saying one is better than the other. It's really a mix of the two, honestly. Um, it's always like any balance. You need balance. But we're right. swinging towards decentralization heavy right now. And if you're trying to fight it in your organization, with your people, with a corporate headquarters, centralized office, you're just going to you're going to lose. Well, again, the metaphor is a wave and a top of the wave and a bottom of the wave. Sure. On the bottom of the wave is fascism. On the bottom of the wave is control by way of one person or group. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's there. It is there because the wave is actually saying decentralization is the way to go. Uh, and the, the conduct of behavior and the world and business all flows with this. Mm -hmm. So the conduct in a fascist in, environment is very different than the conduct in a decentralized environment. We, so we even, we've even seen this in military history. I've talked about this in the past. I believe we have, I don't know if it's the last podcast or other ones in the past, um, of the 14 that we've done, <laughs> um, 14 still in progress, everyone. The uh, So we talk about Napoleon, right? So Napoleon mm -hmm. was decentralized. That was yeah. his military tactic. And by decentralized, the, our, uh, the military, U.S. military is a decentral. It's centralized, but it is very decentralized, is sort decentralized of decision-making yeah. process. You make it, you know, platoon leader in the field, do adjust. Yes. I know the plan. We all agree on the plan, but we all know a plan never really survives you know first contact with with whatever the enemy or a competitor or a customer yeah saving private ryan i'm that is a fabulous example of what happens when all right you have like an objective people mm -hmm. die on the way or they gotta go with another group we can't find private ryan because his squad got yeah, and they were scattered everywhere. And yeah, then they were all scattered, today. just trying to connect and find another a, another objective that is smaller. And that one <laughs> movie, you know, it's like, how do you how do you hit the beach? Well, somebody's got to come up with the idea of taking out, you know, the the you know, the pillbox over there, which there was no, you know, Eisenhower never said take out that pillbox, but you, you know, people have to, to decentralize and take action. Well, so, so going back to the, the story about Napoleon, right? When he fought right. uh, the Prussians in, uh, you know, um, they, they were superior army historically figure. And they were like, Oh, we're going to wipe the French off the planet. It's going to be easy. Yeah. But they were command and control, centralized command and control. Well, what happened was, you know, you take one person or a group of people at top making all decisions. First, they don't have the real-time data in the field to make adjustments. Mm -hmm. The line of communication needs to go through all these layers of bureaucracy. And they would make a decision. By the time they got the information, it was out of date and, and, and. They got mm -hmm. just destroyed quickly. And what Napoleon was, was, again, like the objective. But when you're in there, you are given the ability to basically freelance with it, the idea, right? Yeah. And and that that was a core issue. In fact, um, even in many ways, the Civil War with Robert E. Lee, his downfall in Gettysburg was because he was his army was a centralized command and control. He came up with all the ideas and he had one sort of execution, you know, he was the visionary and he had someone that executed. That was, you know, Stonewall Jackson and good old Stonewall Jackson died in Chancellorville before. Right. And so his Armistead and all of his sort of generals that. So so Lee's point would I come up, he come up with a strategy or or come up with the, the idea, then he would give it to Stonewall and Stonewall would be like, okay, I, I'll figure it out, but that's great. And then he would tell all of his people what to do. But when that happened, so this is the problem with the fault of the centralized control. Once you took Stonewall Jackson out, he was dead. Then Lee would tell his sub generals, I want to go take Little Round Top, take that hill. 
And then they were all standing around being like, I don't know how to take it. Do you know how to take it? Stonewall Jackson always told us what to do. <laughs> so then they timing was wrong, all sorts of things. That was probably the biggest thing that hurt Lee in Gettysburg. And there was the turning of the war because his organization and there's tons of there's his own writings and everything else. He admits all of this that uh, can command control. So a hybrid works always better. It's always a pendulum. It's a balance. But just using those examples, this is why you see a lot of decentralization swinging because we've been very centralized for the past 50, 60 years, honestly, right? But frankly, a lot of people want to be told what to do. Yeah, so there's safety, the idea of safety there, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's safety. And then you look at, um, okay, what kind of education do we have? Mm -hmm. Like, are are we spitting out graduates who in at the high school level or middle school, or are we spitting out people who like to be told what to do? Uh, and as they grow up, that one thing, independent thought and action dictates a global economy. Look mm -hmm. at that. Look how we laddered that right up where if people all want to be told what to do, then we, we kind of have a problem. Uh, yes, and, yes. you know, while, they, while there is comfort in that, there's also tremendous danger in that. Well, we also get, and, we get yeah. Nazis in, get in a way Nazis. that... Yes, yes, we get right. Nazis. Or we get what we have with China right now. Or Russia. <laughs> And we so yeah. or Iran, you know, these totalitarian regimes, that's exactly right. So so I'm not anti-centralized. I'm not pro-decentralized. But I, like we said, the macro trend from a supply chain globalization, countries are being left on their own, is, is being decentralized. And so let's talk about blockchain. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the decentralization of money. Yeah, decentralization of money. Money. So, so you can see just a couple things out there. I, I'm not going to, uh, we don't have enough time. We could do a deep dive on blockchain, crypto and everything else. And that's good. It, you know, if you believe in crypto and what it is, the idea is decentralization, meaning peer to peer, you no longer need a third party to validate or uh, uh, validate who you're saying who you are or the contract or, or, or like a bank transaction secure. You can just send a contract if it's if it's uh, you know uh, I would say like Ethereum or Sol uh, Solana or any of these other uh, sort of programmable money, which would be alternative to Bitcoin. I think that's the key difference. So both are decentralized, meaning um, uh, actually I'm going to take a step back because I actually don't believe these other cryptocurrencies are even decentralized anymore. So, so I will say Bitcoin is decentralized in the fact that there is no middle party controlling the asset itself. It is software based on Web3 on the blockchain and the technology allows um, all of this decentralization of computers, blockchain computers that are processing transaction, peer-to-peer -peer transactions and validating, they're basically hacking the blockchain to create the next block and validate the transactions in that block. They get rewarded, right? So, and those are decentralized, meaning there's no, I mean, there are big groups of companies that have these big blockchain computers. We have a large number of blockchain computers ourselves because we do Bitcoin mining, but the idea is it's basically decentralized data centers and blockchains. You can have a computer in your house processing transactions. And if one of these things goes down, say thousands of them or a whole country locks it down, the transactions continue because they're, you can't kill it. It's all over. It's all, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, so what that allows, the, the reason why Bitcoin exists is because um, countries have used forever have debased its wealth by taking on debt and printing more currency and putting more currency into the market. All countries and, do that. I said all in the yeah, history, all. in the history, history Roman, everything, right? Everybody has so, done that. So in the history of human, the human experiment, right? Uh, 
currency's value, I'm not saying money because money holds value and the dollar is not money. It is a currency, a fiat currency, just like yeah. the Weimar Republic's, uh, you know, Deutsche Mark or uh, the, the uh, gold coin of the, with the emperor's stamp on it in Byzantine Empire, right? Whatever. So, uh, so, so. The, the, and a fiat that, currency for those of you who don't know, because that is a economics kind of term. Yeah. Fiat currency is basically, you know, what's a dollar called? It's a peso. That's a, yeah. that's a fiat currency. And it brings to bear the whole, um, validation and like, what is a currency? What is money? What has value? But that's another. Well, I mean, I think the definition, the <laughs> definition of sound money is the ability to exchange, the ability to exchange and store wealth. Right. And so, so, a currency, a fiat currency like the dollar gives you exchange, right? We can trade dollars for services for anything, right? The, anything. But it does not store your wealth. Now, it stores your wealth better than the what the uh, the Turkish uh, lira or uh, the, the, I'm going to call it a different uh, wrong term or even the euro or the Venezuelan um, e equivalency. But it is still losing value over time. It is still losing value. And we see that in inflation. Right. The, the, the value, the cost, this is the best way to explain it. And you can see it with gold, right? That's why gold bugs believe gold is the best way to fight uh, inflation. Because the price of gold, it used to be a one-to-one. -one one ounce to one dollar type of thing there, there was a time when one ounce was one dollar i'm sure now it's was it i don't know what the current trading is but well, say it varies it's say eighteen hundred dollars to one ounce of gold yeah probably. It, it's always up and down so so what has changed it's not that gold has has cost has changed it's just that the dollar has lost its value yes in and, relation uh, to yeah. assets right Gold is so curious to me. Now, I was at uh, a get together and someone and we were all talking and someone who knows who he is, if he's listening to this, made a comment that all the world's gold can fit inside two Olympic swimming pools. And everyone was like, what? And I've not found that. I, I we didn't do any kind of deep dive. We fact check it, but it's we still have to go, true. Somebody go fact check this because, but it it's like, well, is that the most valuable thing, or are there more valuable metals than gold that we should oh. that we would base this on? I mean, it's it. It's almost well, like well, what is well, money? If you're thirsty, if you're yeah. thirsty, you give as much gold for that cup of water as possible. So water is probably the biggest mm -hmm. asset, right? Um, we can we can survive for days without food. We can't without water, right? So, so yeah, what would a water currency look like? I, it, it, that you know, is a we I hopefully in maybe some dystopian future we get there, but. You know, so yeah, so, so we think to Milwaukee because we have the best water situation in the whole. United well, States, well, and water is a real issue, water scarcity on this planet, and that will continue. Well, although, however, with with desalinization, other technology, and the population collapsing, um, that's a whole other thing to talk about decentralization. But so we get back to why Bitcoin exists. The idea of Bitcoin was invented by under an alias of. Uh, Satoshi uh, Nakamoto, and he basically he was. They were uh, cryptographers that designed a a, pro, a, a money a, a ledger a, on the blockchain. So they kind of really invented this idea, and it allowed people to hold assets. And Bitcoin can only twenty one million can ever be created ever. So you can't create more. 
So that there's a cap on Bitcoin, but there's not a cap on other things. Yeah, there's not a cap on any of the other altcoins. So, yeah. you know, so so other cryptocurrencies and and the proof of work, which is the processing of using computers to process this. A lot of people said, well, it's going to take all this energy. It's not it's not very green. It's, you know, all this stuff. Um, I do believe Bitcoin will probably find a way to solve our energy crisis because it will be valuable and there's enough money that behind it that we will figure it out. And, and, you know, uh, capitalism solves a lot of problems. So, you know, when there's money on the line and wealth, it's the, that's what drives the engine of capitalism. It's a good one. Um, so, but anyway, so, so you have this, this idea that you can hold, convert your dollars to something, some money, some sound money that's in a form of digital that, you don't need to carry with you, right? Because gold, you gotta you gotta pick it up. You it's heavy. Yeah. You're gonna carry a million dollars with you. Um, you can carry it a million dollars of cash, or even a ten thousand, even a hundred dollars. But just a million dollars. How are you gonna transfer a million dollars? You gonna carry a briefcase around with you? Or are you gonna put it in a gold bar? I, I you can put it in diamonds. Diamonds yeah. is the, the lightest, by the way. So loose yes. diamonds is a, and historically art, diamonds. Art. Yeah, historically diamonds have been the currency for that. So people don't have to carry something heavy. They carry right. diamonds. That's that's the historical before you know electronic transfer. So now, and, and if you think about the dollar, the dollar is digital anyways, and we're going to central bank digital currency, which is centralized control. The nice thing about Bitcoin is even though you can track and see all the transactions on the chain, right? Because it's public, you don't, everybody's anonymous behind it. So mm -hmm. you do still get privacy as well. So when you see these, um, like central, the Federal Reserve is, been launching the central bank digital currency that will be here within the next five years and in circulation. I argue. Maybe They're sooner. already doing it, correct? Yes, they are already doing it. It is in a, uh, you know, it is being used. And, and the central bank digital currency does get us closer to that dystopian sort of, you know, uh, 19, what, 84, everybody's being watched type of thing. And so what is being watched, Adam? We're we're not close. We're we're right there. Yeah, we are. We are. We're absolutely right there. So so the last thing to go is where we spend our money on, right? And and the central bank digital currency in the next five years, cash, physical cash will be probably will be illegal. And meaning the point that it won't have the value and most restaurants and stores will not accept cash. So you'll have no choice but to be digital. And then every transaction, I'm not saying I mean, there's- I'm just going to stop because think about how mind freaking blowing that is. That one thing, and you're seeing it already mm -hmm. where there are restaurants that don't, that don't take cash. They don't- COVID have accelerated all of this, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like they're, the accelerator of COVID. Yeah. But think about that. Think about the cultural divisions of haves, have nots, where cash is actually uh, an important thing to have nots. Yes. And because yes. they don't have the hardware to have a digital currency. Well, the so, digital divide keeps expanding too, by the way. Yeah. And for those who don't know what the digital divide, it's those who are in uh, grow up with digital tools and access to computers and those who don't. And, and that divides their knowledge and workforce and creates more scarcity for the ones that aren't digitally savvy to those who are with job opportunities, all sorts of things, even money now with, or currency uh, being able to have access to that, right? Mm -hmm. The world needs ditch diggers, Danny. Well, I the robots know. will take we, over those jobs. The robots but, will take over that. But so, so <laughs> when we, you know, we think about we, yeah, right. We think about central bank digital. I mean, there's some real advantages to having it, right? I do believe that, right? But there's also tons of places it can go off the tracks, meaning. 
Now imagine the Fed wants, oh, by the way, there's no need for banks in this new economy model because right now the Fed can just loan, would be able to, with central bank digital currency, the Fed would be able to loan direct. They would not need a middleman any longer. And banks are middlemen in this process. And they're also holders. They're loaners, but they're holders. Yeah, you, you wouldn't you need any of that. in your own digital wallet then, right? Well, right. So, but so, so if you're going to the digital wallet. currency, your wallet won't be with the bank. Your wallet will be with the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve will become the central bank, which it is, centralization of all central banks, right? So then now if say we have a recession, which people say we're in now and uh, from the numbers, uh, you know, yeah, technically are you we are, we are definitely in it. Like, yeah. So we've been in it. Actually, I'd argue we've been in it since 2019. It's just that we went through this stimulated through COVID piece. Yeah. And you can see that spike and we're coming off of that sugar rush. Right. So, right. So 2019 is when everything started contracting the economy uh, at the end of it. Um, Anyways, and so, so we kicked a can. Say we kicked a can for two years. And now we're now we're living up to it in 2023. So or three years we kicked the can. So, but what can happen now? Say the government wants to stimulate the economy. Now it's programmable, like Ethereum, meaning you can then tell people, "All right, I'm going to stimulate this price for you. Will have five hundred dollars, and you can spend that five hundred dollars in your central bank digital currency, but you got to spend it in the next seven days." And if and you can only spend it on certain things, and if you don't spend it on those things, we're going to take it back out of your pocket. And and that is literally where I'm not saying that's what they're going to do, but they will be able to do that. So then you're well, fighting. That's, that's crazy. But that that has been put out there in white papers from central banks and the Inter international monetary fund and other things. So it's definitely part of the thinking, and and their rationale from the central planner perspective. Remember, centralization is bad. Yeah. Like just like total decentralization can be bad either way, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they want that control so they can then you know, stimulate the economy, keep things going, avoid a recession. So it's all in good intent, right? Good intent, but you know, some of the biggest so they're just trying to circulate of our time money. were good intent, right? Yeah, so, they're just trying to circulate money in that. They're just yeah, trying, they're trying to in the velocity make, of money and speed yes. it up and and, and, and speed control up. inflation. Right. So but uh, so, if people uh, spend money, then inflation goes I, down. I'm not saying central bank digital currency is bad, but if it starts to turn into that, it does bad. But it is open up the ability to do those things that was no longer uh, able. And, oh, by the way, no matter what you spend it on, it's trackable to you as an individual. So, so yes, crime could be reduced, but then what are you going to use? So, so then when you start thinking about the case for Bitcoin, Bitcoin starts to give you that privacy. It gives you your control back. It allows you to hold your wealth outside of any sovereign government that is looking to take your wealth to spend it on their programs or their own self-interest at a central control level. So I'm, I'm not saying that's all true. I'm just saying this is the belief system around that. I, I tend to be on this belief system too, so everybody knows, but, but you can argue with it. But just the fact, this is one of the primary use cases of why Bitcoin and these other cryptocurrencies were developed. And well, can you talk about, I'm interrupting you, Sure, go um, right ahead. But can you talk about too big to fail? Because the the argument that I hear a lot um, against this and the, the argument against decentralization of money, and you've just made a very nice argument for Bitcoin as opposed to, you know, the beta testing for uh, Ethereum and other trackable tokens. So... Too big to fail. You're basically saying all the banks are going to fail. All these places mm -hmm. on our street corners, like they, they, they're growing banks around here. Like how can we have so many banks? And banks are big. And banks are, personally, I think they're the new mafia because they have so much control over people that yeah. it's 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 a preposterous 
system, but we all accept it. Well, let's remember the Federal Reserve is not a government institution, is a collection of the big banks. Oh, okay. So it is not a government. Okay. It is okay. the private banks all got together and started this. That to me is like my mind is blown, but, but that makes so much. Most sense. people don't know this because nobody I, wants. Yeah, I didn't know, know it. This. You put you you put a, the word federal on it, and you think, oh, it's a it's a U.S. thing. Oh yeah, they look very federal too. You've seen the Federal Reserve. The building oh. itself is right next to all the other federal yeah. buildings on Constitution Avenue in D.C. Here, right? Holy. And we have the biggest one, really? right? Because we control the currency of the world. So, mm -hmm. so and we are using as a country currency as a weapon. And so what I mean by that, the U.S. dollar is losing its currency reserve status for the fact that we're that like we're using it as a weapon and shutting off countries that aren't doing what we want them to do. Not saying they're they're We're not right. Just saying that countries like Russia, China, Iran, India, KSA, King of Saudi Arabia, all of these guys are getting together and using their currencies now. And that and and they it's we got to remember 85% of the world's debt is denominated in US dollars. Okay. So the world needs our dollars. So we're good in the US. So, but outside the world, you know, if your your debt is denominated in a dollar and you're in the local currency, and the local currency is going to inflation to the moon, like 20, 30, 50%. Right. In some countries. You're going to dollars, right? You want to flood the dollars so you can pay your debt off in dollars, right? So there's a re going to be a real demand uh, on our dollars. And um, uh, forgetting his last name, uh, Brent uh, talks about the, uh, the was it the milkshake, uh, dollar milkshake theory. The idea that everybody's going to be sucking up the dollars because they want to pay down their debt. So there's going to be a huge demand on dollars. And then and then there's going to be a run. And once people stop, the debt stops being denominated in dollars, all those dollars are going to be flooding back to the United States because that's our number one export, everyone, is U.S. dollars. So once it comes back, and that allows us to have a, uh, a debt to GDP ratio of 130% what it is today. Remember, Janet Yellen had said we got to raise our debt ceiling yeah. again. It, it's like, I don't know. I mean, this is what I'll say. I don't think anybody knows, and I don't know what is our debt ceiling, a real debt ceiling. It's, it's clearly not here at where we are today because the country isn't collapsing. Is it 300% jet, debt to GDP? Is it 500%? Maybe it doesn't matter. Right. At all. But at, when we go to a central bank digital currency, it won't matter as much. And that's why people are going down that road. So there is some goodness to it, right? It allows yeah. us to be more flexible. However, there is a real command and control uh, totalitarian you know, watch state that can be created once they own your wealth, right? So so I think the two yeah. should coexist, right? So and, and I want to talk about Ethereum and the rest, how they aren't decentralized any longer. Right. Um, and the thing that we used to talk about quite some time ago, but I think is still relevant, is when we're talking about a decentralized banking system mm -hmm. uh, or a banking system outside of the Federal Reserve, then that one thing, imagine if you will, Milwaukee had its banking system mm -hmm. and it was Bitcoin based or blockchain based and it could be run by uh, uh, people with X values. So the, the cluster of values comes together to run their own banking system Well, outside of the Federal Reserve. So as there are dark uh, possibilities with fascists running their own banking system. There's also light possibilities. Too. Yeah, there's, there's yes, there, there, there totally is. I just mean the fact that it's still decentralized. Nobody can control the flow of it. It's yeah. peer to peer. If people decide to use a more centralized system, perfect. If that aggregation helps in some ways get it to more people, I think that's smart. Um, I think, like I said, it's a hybrid model is what is going to work in the end. You know, um, 
companies like FTX, which obviously is all over the news and giving crypto oh, a bad man. name, it's not that crypto is bad. It was that FTX yeah. was bad and they were centralized too, right? So that whole idea of of being decentralized but then going back to everything holding everything central obviously failed right so yeah. so i think there is the nice thing is that we will all have our wealth in our hands and can do what we want to it and it can't be debased the other thing that is really interesting about the decentralized de decentralization of money itself is that governments can't spend our wealth away for wars we don't want to fight because they can't pay for it because we don't need to give them our money. I, um, Frank, not saying that will happen. I would love that to happen, right. but in theory, that's one of the arguments for big. Yeah. For big but, well, the, that's the thing that people that are futurists look at or people like us who are trying to, in some ways predict, uh, you know, we'll talk about the gray swans and try to predict the black swans. Um, you know, if you keep pulling it out, and pulling it out, the idea that there will be no money for war is a really compelling reason to decentralize. Well, so imagine, so imagine if Putin found himself in a decentralized world, right? He just they just dropped him in, and he was trying to do what he did, but that yeah. infrastructure was established already. He would have no funding or means to wage war without direct citizen consent because say say all of your the nation's wealth individually is stored in say say bitcoin okay i'm not saying that's the best yes. but say it's bitcoin it's atom coin call whatever you want but it's atom coin. it's not controlled by the government right then what happens is we all become global citizens and then this whole thing of tribalism and you know we can mm -hmm. kind of get more globalized honestly because um, we have one, ironically, central currency that's decentralized, right? Even See what I mean? Even though it's centralized, yeah. in fact, we're all using Bitcoin, we're all on the same page, we can do whatever we want, and we have control of it in a very, you know, free to, in a freedom of money type of way, right? We can spend it on whatever we want, we invest in whatever we want. If we want a government to go to war, we can we can put money into it, whatever. So so it's just, it's just fascinating, right, of what kind of control that gives back to individuals and so there is uh, there is a hybrid model that we need to strive for i don't, I don't know where it is and, and it's obviously uh different ways but so yeah. that's, that's just it's kind of like a go fund me or yeah. a go or well, you know it's it's like a collective of people who choose to do this because their money is fluid well, it, it's the it's the idea of just peer to peer lending, regardless right. of Bitcoin. There's peer to peer lending out there, right? And that was hot several years ago, but yeah, now it's, and, you know, it's how you don't you just don't hear about it. And many states have made it illegal. And why have they made it illegal? Because the banks are lobbying the government. And now I sound tinfoil hat, Adam. Time, but I'm telling you, that's how it works. I'm just know from the insider ball. That's how it works. Yeah. And and they are keeping things controlled because. That's in their best interest. Which is the two big, you know, will banks let this happen? The Federal Reserve will not let this happen because it is the end of the Federal Reserve and it is the end of banks. Well, so PNC, let's talk about PNC. For those on the West Coast, they probably don't know, or in Europe, PNC, we can look them up. Um, it's uh, one of the larger banks in the United States. They will not support any business in crypto guns and uh gambling or whatever and so that's the category they, oh in cannabis in cannabis, cannabis psychedelics so so so, so, so you just put it in perspective they they look at as bad as things that murder people and cannabis does not murder people by the way uh it's way better alcohol kills people versus and that's a whole other thing uh, so, so if you think about that, that's how much. And PNC is a very much a laggard bank, and 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 so. But I just um, what I'm saying, and they try to ban people being able to transfer money to crypto exchanges to buy Bitcoin, and then everybody freaked out, right? So the banks are trying, but they can't. It's out of their hand. The Pandora's box is open. It's already out. The the 
It's already flown out of the box. They closed it. They tried to hold on. There's no more going back. It's like the internet. And and I want to show you really quickly here. I'm gonna I'm gonna show a oh, slide. Oh, your charts real. are so good on this stuff. So gonna, yeah, you need to show us. I'm gonna show here. Hold on. Uh, let's see. I'm just gonna show a a a chart here. Um, let's see if I pull it up here. Okay. So let's see here. Oh, All technology right. adoption curve. Yes. So this is the, the you know, so yeah. there's a bigger technology adoption curve, which is like a bell curve, and and we can get into that in a different discussion. But but this looks at uh, crypto users versus internet users. So internet users are the white line, and crypto users are the orange line. Now this is a little bit of order older chart from 2021, I believe. But the point is. Crypto adoption is happening faster than the internet. So I always joke when people say, oh, this is never going to take off. This is never going to take off. It's already taken off. You're just ignorant on the topic. So it's just a matter of how it now Bitcoin is lumped in here. Bitcoin being the largest crypto asset. Obviously, they're they're the whale. They're the number one. They're the market leader, which will always stay the leader because of the followers paradox. Like we've mm -hmm. talked, talked about. So uh, so. So my only point is, if you don't understand decentralization and certainly cryptocurrencies or start with Bitcoin, then you literally won't understand how money works in the future. And that future is happening yeah. within by 2030. We will be at pretty close to a, a large adoption of this globally. And 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 I and I joke because a lot of people will say, oh, this will never happen in the U.S. But then people forget that we're not the world. We're actually one of the smaller populations. The rest of the world does not, it, you know, it's funny. When you have money in another country that is not Western Europe or the United States, mm -hmm. you try to buy assets in real estate in the U.S. because yeah. you know it's safe, it's safe right? Yeah. And it's going to grow up, grow in value. Right. That's why China owns like Hollywood. Well, Yes, yes, they're buying land. I mean, because and they're taking their communist money from the people and then exporting it to protect yeah. it, which is a whole other scandal. But in 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 counter in, in corruption. But I just mean everybody else in the world. This is a lifeline. If you don't have dollars, this is a lifeline for you for them. And so, uh, I it's it just changes a lot of things. And it's more than just digital currency, cryptocurrencies, programmable money. You can do contracts now. Like you don't need lawyers for, for selling land. You can just exchange a smart contract with a, you yes. know, with a registration certification. Like there's so many use cases being developed for this on the programmable money. Bitcoin is not programmable, but Ethereum and other these other cryptocurrencies you may have heard of are like Cardano, big fan of Cardano, are programmable money, which means that you can create a token and then that token can represent another asset or another thing. And it's just a smart contract. And then it has whoever owns it is registered and on the blockchain that can never be hacked or what have you. And that's it never, Titanic could never get sunk. But I just mean it is the most difficult compared to other um, networks. It's probably one of the most secure. Certainly Bitcoin is the most secure of technology networks in the world. So um, just from perspective, and we are 113 right now. So we are, um, we've been talking a lot about central bank we, digital currencies, crypto. We haven't even gotten to the other. Mega no, we haven't. So we are going to have to do a part three. So <laughs> So let's talk, let's let's shift Healthcare, a little bit. Healthcare, employment, transportation. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about the the idea of uh, gig economy, people. Okay, we have. We, and we maybe we'll time. run out of time. I, I'm not sure. We can always continue the conversation, but you know, we think of decentralization. Uber, Airbnb, like the way pe people are not going to have jobs like they have had in the past. Denise, yes. talk if, about that. Okay, thank you. Um, because there will be a new class of, of people called employed. Because employment is, is degenerating because 
companies do not want. I mean, people say, oh, people don't want to work for a company. That's not true. Companies don't want to pay benefits. Companies do not want the responsibility of a workforce. Companies now realize that they can use the gig economy to their advantage in the sense that uh, it, you know, we'll, we'll pay them if they're doing a good job. No, they're not. You know, we're having a bad month and we're not going to rehire them. The idea that the gig economy is has been done because people want their freedom, I think is is really naive because that's a nice spin on, oh, I want to be my own boss. Oh, I don't want to report to the man. Oh, I, you know, I, you know, prefer doing my own time. I think that's all uh, being fed. And again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but those kinds of things are what happens when uh, someone is, is, is trying to feed you a line of feces. Mm -hmm. Really, employment is going to go away. The class of people who will be employed will be an upper class and not a lower class. So when you look at the gig economy, there's going to, and, and people say, well, you know, Airbnb isn't doing well. Well, uh, Uber isn't doing well. It, stop, just stop, because there will be others and there are others. And it is a continuous improvement of their model. Yes. But it, and things will die and other things will grow. And yeah, better versions of Uber or Airbnb or whatever. Yeah adjacencies to those things that create new markets. So, um, but point being, it's, it's like when you talk about uh, robots, we talked about AI a lot, you know, that tsunami is, we are in the middle of that tsunami. It's not going away. It's going to accelerate through compounding, which we talked about before. And Jobs are going to be lost. So you're going to have to ask yourself, what is the job I'm going to find? Uh, because I'm not going to be employed and I'm going to be out on the street and I got to fend for myself. Truly, you know, then you'll go, oh, can I freelance? Can I, it's like, you know, it's like, well, that's, that's not that rosy. And what happens there is that you lose health care benefits. We're a horrible country for health care. Where's, where's your health care benefit anymore? Um, how much do you have to pay for health care under, you, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act? It's very expensive, actually. It's not the yeah, it's affordable. Not very, it's not very good, it's actually. It's not affordable. <laughs> it's the Expensive Care Act. Yeah. And it's going to cause such a turmoil. But then the other element coming in this, just and, I, and I'm already riffing on my own thread, is when you look at healthcare, right now, curiously, everyone goes, oh, the, you know, hospitals, hospitals are going bankrupt. There aren't enough nurses. There aren't enough doctors hospitals aren't going to get paid from the government that let little sugar high on COVID anymore. This is a crisis just boiling up in a cauldron of, um, I'm going to call it greed, it, in it, a cauldron of greed. It, when, and when uh, and about all those influences. And, and I just add to that, and we're, we're looking in front of us as a global population collapse. Yes. Yes. That is happening. Migration is an issue that we cannot ignore. Um, so, and healthcare costs in this country are like two, three, four points over uh, the, the, the rise of the economy. I mean, our gross national product is projected to be yeah, four. Healthcare costs are projected to be seven. 
um, in the coming five years, 7% more expensive than they are now. Well, well, it, it, and for companies, you know, healthcare, you know, health insurance has doubled just about almost every year. So, oh, it, yeah. so it's becoming just, it's just, it's on, it's a broken, it's broken. I mean, we all talk about healthcare is broken and it's one of those soul world hunger type of things, but the system, the centralized system is collapsing and it doesn't need to be as complex it is because of all these, it just doesn't need to be the way it is, but it needs to burn. And then we need to build something that's better, unfortunately. It does need to burn and it will be burning yep. and it will cause uh, people will lose lives. Uh, people won't be able to get health care for their children who are sick. And this all sounds dystopian as a bad thing. And it is. But uh, we have the ability to fix it. Mm -hmm. And anybody who fixes that this or is part of the solution, and that's the beauty of capitalism, uh, and it's the beauty of karmic capitalism, anybody who fixes this and points in this direction is going to make a lot of money. This is where the new wealth will come from, is fixing this problem. So, so you know, going back to... I mean, let's. Add, well, I just I want to follow up on just that point real quick yes. before we go back to the decentralization of of people and their their own pursuits. It's almost like everybody's going to be their own company someday, yes. and and collaborate is the idea because I see it as we're all self employed in a way, but we're grouping up because we want to team up to build something bigger for a saga. We have to group. We have to group up for our for the saga because we're always stronger together. Yes. So that's. I don't decentralization. People think it's all going to be individualized and everything else. No, we're talking about moving to smaller groups that are more focused on things that they care about and can impact things and that are more autonomous. So they don't are, aren't slow and they can be more agile in those things. So and the healthcare yeah. the question, who's going to solve this? Is the industry healthcare industry going to solve this? They, I don't think they can. Right. I think that they're, they're, uh, you know, both legs have been cut out and they don't have the money or the, you know, the profit, the margin, and uh, they're in a, they're running around in a I don't certain think they have the vision either. They don't have the vision. And usually people who are in an organization or a sector cannot see vision like people outside or adjacent to those sectors, you know, we are, we, what we do, we're disciplined to see vision that is outside of the forest and the trees. That's our discipline here. And it's very hard for organizations who are traditional to go, okay, I'm going to break the mold. I'm going to break the model. There, it, 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 it's a rare bird. It, will, well, it, it is funny because it's like, there's such a conflict of interest with the whole thing. And, and, and it, it, you look at our politicians and government, we're going to solve this problem. Let's go ask big business and big industry how we're going to solve the problem that they've created for all of us. Well, if they, it's not that they're evil. It's just the fact that they don't know the solution because they caused the problem. And they have a, 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 an a a vested interest to keep things as status quo as possible. So there's such a conflict there and, mm -hmm. and you know what they're doing because of course the big businesses have funded these political campaigns. So, so it's, it's yeah, that's not the answer. It's not, it's going to it's come not. from Let's a just... white knight or, yep. you know, you know, not saying that's a dude, but I just mean in general, you know, woman, man, just coming out of the blue or he, she, they, um, but it will come from someone, some beautiful soul, infinite soul that sees it and actually can do it. And I just, I just hope that uh, as many other white swans that are going to come in, you know, there is manifest destiny in some of this stuff, yes. right? So the universe yes. is on their side, not the current status quo, right? So correct. And, you know, the universe plays an important role in all of this. And it is, the, it truly is the white swan in this, in, or silver swan or something like that. 
because it you don't know what it's going to deliver you we cannot if you if you can predict a lot of things and we do and they're they're all rational and they're all connecting rational dots that we choose to connect but the universe is not in those dots it is in and here it comes the wind blows and we never expected the wind to be this color or this wind to be this this temperature or the wind to be this isn't even wind like what is this thing that just happened and that will happen it has to happen because that's the only thing that can effectively change things on a on a mass basis yeah so so we're we're coming at the end of our time and we will definitely do a part three because there's much more to talk about <laughs> january is going to be the month of 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 macro and mega trends and trends of 2023. Obviously, everything we've talked about, we're seeing right now, but is going to be coming for the next decade, 20, 30 years. This is going to be a lot of the stuff that continues every year, certainly for this next decade. And I guess the reason why we're we're telling everybody this and, and going through this is because, A, we want to make sure everybody's aware of this, right? of the things that we're seeing. Yeah, we, we see it. We see it every day and get validated every day. And, so. and, and, and it's our job in many ways for our clients to, yes. to uncover opportunities created from these, these mm -hmm. big shifts. Right. And, and, and it, here's the thing about these shifts. I, I want us to remember this is, these are physical features of this third density reality. So don't be afraid of this stuff. This is, karmically aligned to our path in our own evolution on a soul level. So, so embracing the opportunity that these create is how we grow. Right. And, and it is why we're here at this time moment. And because we all chose to incarnate. You may not believe this, but believe Inter this. Intergalactic you, history. You literally picked this time to come here and experience this. So you'll have one person to blame if you're not having fun in it as yourself. So for many reasons. But you chose this. We chose this. I chose this. You chose this, Denise. Um, and, and our wisdom self of our higher self knew this was the time that the community needed us, ourselves needed us. And so don't don't get scared. This is this is great. You know, this is the best time. This is the time to be alive on this planet. And it's super exciting. And there's so much more to talk about. Um, so I will say we will, we will miss you guys next week because we're super busy and trying to put all this stuff together. And we have lots of other things going, exciting things going on in our, yeah. on our, our non podcast lives. So next week we'll, we will be on a break, but only to be making this better for all of you. And then coming back, we'll do part three the following week and it will be super exciting. And that will conclude our sort of trends. And we'll always talk about trends every week, which we did because consciousness is itself a big macro of all macro trends yeah. as we believe. So, yes. so anything you want to add, Denise, before we, we, we hop off and give everyone back their day. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this because, um, you know, we might have snuck up on you with a, whether you're listening because we talk about crazy stuff or whether you're listening because we talk about advertising, um, this probably surprised you in that most people don't, you know, if they have to seek it out but they don't get hit in the face with a lot of these questions on a day to day. Uh, so I think it's kind of fun to talk about it and think about it. Uh, but I hope we didn't make you run away scared and screaming. As Adam says, this is all, this is all white light and, and beauty. This is all, uh, destined by a positive force. This is all something to embrace as opposed to uh, ignore or hang on or complain about because um, it's good. 
It's all good. Yeah. All of us are on this planet at this time to oh. usher. Yeah, we are here to usher in a new level, a new earth, a new level of consciousness, a new level idea of doing business. And it's all going to set us free to pursue what we really should all be pursuing is our growth on a soul level. And, and, you know, we, Denise and I channel well our growth through the projects and things that we do. And, and, and my hope is whether it's robots, whether it's decentralization, whether it's deglobalization, whether it's the, the, this destruction of totalitarian regimes, whatever will free everyone to pursue you know what they're supposed to be pursuing so get rid of the noise so to speak but still have fun and enjoy all of the fantastic things this experience provides if it's cars for people there's nothing wrong with that there's if yeah. it's vacations and experiences toes in the sand if it is do it you know if it's a good steak, I'm not. Uh, Denise might argue with me, but I'll let you go on that one. You know, if they're it's making nice steak out steak. of cells now, so I will be eating the steak that is okay. made excellent. out of excellent. steak cells. Okay, excellent. so and excellent. another which is a trend. Of food. There's crazy food trends going on right now yes. too. So, but thank you, everyone. Thanks, Denise. Thanks for being a great co-host and and helping us navigate these changes that are happening. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, have a great day, great rest of your week. And we will be off next week, but not off because we're going to be working hard. We just won't be having a podcast next week. And then we'll, we'll see all of you the week after. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day and talk soon. Bye. Bye.